Good afternoon and welcome to the Medical Imaging Trends and Sensor Technology Developments webinar hosted by Census Daily and presented by Omnivision. I'm Matt Durgis, Editor-in-Chief of Census Daily Online and Census Daily Update Newsletter. I'll be both your host and moderator for today's webinar. Today's topic will be, will be presented to you by an expert in the field, Mr. Tazib Gunja, Director of Medical Marketing at Omnivision. Tazib joined Omnivision in August of 2011 as Partnership and Business Development Manager for the EMEA region and was appointed Director of Medical Marketing in March 2015. He is responsible for leading the medical business at Omnivision, including strategy formulation, product management, and ecosystem and business development. Tazib will take you on a journey through the subtle and intricate details of medical imaging, as well as paradigms that are both trends and others that are effective. Before we begin, though, I have two points to cover. First, there'll be a Q&A session at the end of Tazib's presentation. However, feel free to submit your questions during the presentation via the Zoom interface, and we will get to them in order at the end. Also, should we run out of time before we get to all of your questions, we can have them answered via email later. Second, the webinar is being recorded and will be available later this week on the Census Daily website and our YouTube channel. Now, without further verbosity, I'll hand the mic over to Tazeeb Gunja. Thank you, Matt. Uh, my name is Tazeeb. I'm the Director of Medical Marketing at Omnivision, responsible for the global business at Omnivision. Uh, I'm based in the UK. Um, so today I'll be talking about uh, medical imaging. Uh, what are the trends happening in the market? Uh, what are the challenges and what are the solutions uh, to the developing market? So this is the agenda, market trends and analysis. Uh, this market has some unique challenges, uh, which we'll uh, highlight. Uh, and then I'll also present some solutions on how to overcome those challenges. And then we'll close and then right at the end, we'll have a Q&A. So let's start off by a philosophical question. Um, two questions. Which one would you rather have? Would you rather have an open surgery you know, where you're cut open uh, and the procedure is performed? Or would you rather have a minimally invasive surgery where essentially it's a keyhole surgery um, and the disruption is not as much? Second question, which one would you rather have? Would you rather have a surgery done on you using a reusable device where there's a risk of cross-contamination? Or would you use a single use or a disposable device where there is no risk of cross-contamination? These are pretty simple questions, uh, but the answers to these uh, questions are quite profound and have a huge impact on our business. Most people would say they want minimally, minimally invasive, and most people would say they want disposable. And that's certainly what, where the market is moving. So let's talk about the market trends and analysis. So first of all, let's start with medical imaging. Medical imaging is a very vast field. Um, you can break it in terms of the electromagnetic spectrum. On one hand, you have MRI. Uh, you, you, in the near IR, you have optical coherence tomography. In the visible spectrum, you have endoscopy. And then on the other extreme, you have nuclear medicine, CT scan. You can also think of uh, medical imaging in terms of uh, uh, the mechanical um, wave transmission, and there you have ultrasound. And there are a number of ways to uh, visualize uh, an anatomy, depending on whether you're trying to visualize cells, tissues, organs, or the entire body. Um, uh, endoscopy, obviously, microscopy, optical coherence tomography, ultrasound, X-ray, CT scan, MRI, vector scan. So what we are seeing is two things. One is endoscopy is moving, um, is broader uh, than just the visible spectrum. So we are now seeing applications in the near IR spectrum as well as the UV spectrum. The second trend that we are seeing is now people are saying, well, if, I, if, if the image sensor is becoming so small, if the endoscope is becoming so small, and if the, um, invasion to the patient is minimal, then why not use direct visualization? Why use indirect means of visualization? So we are seeing the application of CMOS imaging in microscopy, in OCT, ultrasound, as well as MRI. It's not to say that these markets will go away, but part of uh, traditional analysis 
for diagnosis done by these procedures will now be carried out using direct visualization. The other trend we are seeing is the environment in which medical treatment is imparted to the patient. Uh, so it's moving out of the hospital into the doctor's clinic or office, and then eventually it's moving into the home. Now, when the shift happens, it produces some profound um, changes to many dimensions of the market. So first of all, uh, you know, the, the kind of procedures you can do. So in the hospital, obviously, you can do all procedures. In the doctor's office, you are a bit limited. You can do your nose and throat. You can do every management, orthopedics and gynecology. At home, you can do cholesterol, blood, diabetes. So the number of procedures decreases. Second, the size. Um, you know, the, this is the operation theater. You can have large equipment. In a doctor's office, the size has to be small to medium. In the home, you want small devices. Complexity in the hospital is high. That complexity has to move towards low as um, people are not trained um, are, are starting to do these procedures. Cleaning in the, in the hospital, you can have comprehensive cleaning, so you can have reusable uh, devices. Um, in the doctor's office or the home, there is no uh, cleaning facility, so it has to be a single-use device. Automation, uh, you have very trained nursing staff and surgeons in the hospital, so the automation is low. But as you move to the home, uh, where essentially you have a lay, a lay user, the automation has to become high. The channels to which products are sold, medical products are sold, also changes. Uh, usually medical device companies or distributors sell uh, to the hospital or doctor. Now uh, these devices uh, can be bought from the pharmacy or, or retail. The price high in the hospital starts coming down as these devices become consumer kind of devices. And the volume on the other hand, the hospital is usually if it's a reusable device, volume is low. Um, at home, the volume is high. And we pretty much have engagements with customers in all these different market segments. So as this shift happens, it's going to change the dynamics of uh, the kind of devices, the economics of these devices, um, and various aspects of these devices. The second trend is, um, um, is, to, is to do with, again, the location. So, you know, if you, the, the traditional method is you go to a doctor, a doctor, um, once a special report, he sends you off to a lab. They probably draw some blood or some sample from you. Um, or the it's done in the doctor's office. It is then sent to the lab, it's diagnosed, documented. Doctor then calls you in and then you have a discussion and then you have a prognosis. So it's a long, complex, expensive cycle um, to diagnose a particular ailment in a patient. So there is a big push towards testing in the office or point of care devices. Um, where you know saliva or a blood sample is captured, it is then placed on some kind of cartridge, which is then put inside uh, a handheld device. The 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 um, the intelligence is in the device, and then you know you get a very clear reading, uh, kind of go or no go kind of reading on, uh, which then forms the basis of the diagnosis. Um, remote and telemedicine. So this is an example. You can see this picture where the doctor and the patient are not sitting in the same room, especially in an environment like today's. Um, uh, this uh, this area is is really taking off remote medicine or telemedicine, and then home healthcare where you know you're monitoring yourself and you pre you you uh, preventing the onset of disease. The second um, change which is happening is the actual solutions. If you see today, um, most of the revenue that medical device manufacturers generate is from selling equipment, from selling hardware, consumables. Um, and you differentiate based on product innovation. But that's based on historic, uh, you know, what's already happened and you're trying to treat the patient. That's moving towards variable and health analysis where you get real-time information and you make real-time judgments. And eventually it'll move to smarter medical solutions, robotics, AI, um, where it's the algorithm or it's the intelligent in these devices, which, which looks at the past and predicts the future and then recommends a course of treatment, which would prevent certain diseases or ailments from happening in the future. So again, as this uh, trend is being played out, uh, there'll be different places in the value chain where value can be added or revenue can be generated, whether it's software, hardware, uh, backend service. Um, so all this is changing and you'll see new players coming in. So as a result of all these changes, the overall medical device uh, industry is in a state of flux. Um, 
and we all adap adapting uh, to kind of this new way of uh, uh, importing medical treatment. So this is a unique market. It has some unique challenges. Um, so let's walk through some of the challenges. So there are two kinds of challenges. One is market challenges, just by the nature of the market. And second is product challenges, the way the product is. So the first challenge is a fragmented market. You've got the top 30 or 50 uh, big uh, medical device manufacturers, but then you've got literally 1,000, 2,000 small manufacturers. So the real question is, how do you scale a business model, uh, especially from a supplier point of view, which is going to um, adapt to the size of the customer? These devices can have a long lead time, so there's a heavy upfront uh, investment in terms of uh, sales and engineering effort. Uh, but once the device is on the market, it can stay on the market for at least seven to 10 years. We have customers who got devices on the market for 30 years. So then the challenge is, how do you have a stable supply chain if you're going to support that product for a long time? Um, time to market, it wasn't so much in the past, but it's becoming more and more important um, that people are getting to market quicker. So there you need full turnkey solutions, you need lenses, you need image sensors, you need cablings, you need signal processing, you need displays, you know, pretty much people are looking for solutions um, rather than bits and pieces. Um, so they can get to time to market quicker. And evolving market, because it's an evolving market, the forecast, the demands are changing rapidly. So that puts, uh, you know, a need for flexibility in the supply chain to adapt to these uh, changing ramp up schedules. So those were the market challenges. Now, what are the product challenges? Uh, so the product challenges, if you look at endoscopy, for example, there are about 30 different kinds of endoscopy, probably needing each procedure needs about 20 different kinds of endoscopes. So when you multiply the number of procedures times the number of devices needed per procedure, you get a very large um, number of uh, devices that need to be supported. So that becomes a challenge. How do you make components which will cater to all these uh, different devices? Now, the, the good news is that you can group a lot of these devices into buckets. And in the end, you end up with about six, six to 10 buckets uh, that you make devices for. So even though there are lots of devices, um, you can harmonize a lot of the requirements and come up with kind of a optimal roadmap um, for these devices. Cross-contamination um, is a product um, challenge. If you don't clean um, these devices uh, between uses uh, uh, appropriately, you have a risk of cross-contamination. People have died as a result of that. And cost, if you're making a single-use device, um, you know, per part cost is going to be very important to compete against reusable devices. And also the production cost of these devices. So you, you need uh, solutions which are relatively easy to make with low production cost. Um, and then, you know, there's always this discussion of, uh, you know, people want smaller size, people want better image quality. They want to, they want to view a uh, wide view angle so they can view uh, large parts of the anatomy, closer viewing distance as we go deeper inside the body, the focusing range becomes smaller and obviously the ease of integration. And then the last thing is, uh, you know, there are lots of medical certifications. Each region tends to have its own certifications. Um, so obviously, how do you navigate through all this, um, you know, certificate? Uh, it, um, because there's a cost and schedule impact uh, to get your product certified in, even in every region. So those were the challenges. So how do you solve, um, or how do you try and address some of these challenges? So we'll, we, we'll present some solutions. Um, and um, obviously, you know, there are many challenges to overcome. So these are the key applications. If you look at direct visualization or CMOS-based visualization, these are the key applications. So if I walk you through some of them, um, so single-use devices, uh, for single-use device, small size and cost are the most important parameters. Um, what can you do with uh, single-use devices? You can make endoscopes, catheters, pill cam or capsule endoscopes, and laryngoscopes. For reusable devices, uh, usually high resolution, high image quality is very important. 3D, many times people want uh, 3D images, especially for surgery and robotic surgery kind of applications. Camera-based positioning, so you have ultrasound probes that, or OCT probes that go inside the body that need to be positioned in the right place. So the camera now is a positioning device, not as an image capture device. Robotic surgery, um, there's a lot of visualization that happens in the visible spectrum, but also 
um, outside the visible spectrum. So examples are near IR, uh, that happens in the near infrared region. Chromoendoscopy, where you inject dyes in the patient and the dyes then fluoresce and to expose different parts of the anatomy. Or virtual endoscopy, where you're shining light of different wavelengths. Um, that wavelength gets absorbed at different depths in the tissue. And again, reveals different part of the vascular system. Um, our cameras are getting so small that people are now starting to put it in um, things like endoscopic tools. So th those are the kind of the endoscopic markets. Uh, dental. Uh, so the main applications for dental are uh, 3D scanning for dentures, for crowns, for braces. And same thing, our cameras are getting so small that people are putting it in dental tools. Here's an example of a camera in a dental mirror. Health monitoring. So this is a very amorphous and uh, developing field. Um, these are some of the uh, key developments happening. Clinical diagnosis. So this is point of care. Um, here's uh, you take us you take a sample saliva or blood you put it on the cartridge usually there's a chemical reaction you stick the cartridge in this handheld device and then you get a clean display uh, showing you you know whether it's type a type b flu or something like that remote medicine so here's an example of a remote medical device it has it has different attachments uh, that the patient attaches and then it, you know it, it can diagnose uh, skin disorders uh, heart rate um, you can put it in your ear uh, the tongue, the eye, so various parts of the anatomy and then it transmits that information remotely to the, the doctor and the doctor can do the first level of diagnosis. If there's something suspicious, he can call you in for a face-to-face -face visit. Food and drug analysis, so this is usually using spectral techniques where you're trying to analyze um, you know, different foods um, or different medicine. Dermatology, so these are various skin uh, diseases. Barcode reader, so this is essentially uh, authenticating the strip uh, in the barcode, and then medical AR, um, where you are essentially augmenting the surgeon's view with some kind of augmented reality. And then there are some other uh, endoscopic areas like veterinarian for small birds and animals, and industrial. But usually these uh, these areas pretty much used whatever has been developed. Um, so the medical endoscopy leads the way, and then veterinary industrial kind of follows what medical endoscopy does. So the, uh, what I would like to do is have a poll um, and ask this question from the audience. Um, so beyond endoscopy, what are the most promising medical applications that use a CMOS image sensor technology? And you will see there are five options, catheters, dental, point of care, remote medicine, and food and drug analysis. So you should see some prompt appear on your screen uh, that which allows you to vote um, and so I'll give you a few seconds to vote and then we can tally up the results and see uh, what do people think is the most promising area okay so the results should be coming up there you go those are the results so it looks like catheter seems to be the area where people feel um, is the most uh, applicable area for CMOS point of care and remote medicine. And we feel the same way, to be honest. Catheter is a, is a very big market. There are 1.6 billion catheters used every year. Uh, all of them are disposable. Uh, so the volume can be like, you know, consumer kind of volume. Um, there are two main challenges for catheters. One is small size. You need to make, make the uh, camera very small uh, so it doesn't disrupt the working of the catheter, or doesn't make the diameter of the catheter uh, bigger. So that's one challenge which we can overcome. We have, I'll show you, we have sensors which are small enough to overcome. But I think um, the, uh, big, the bigger challenge is, is cost. You know, a lot of these catheters are simple plastic tubes. They cost $2.50, $3, $5. So if something costs that much, then how do you add any kind of electronics uh, to the catheter? So I think cost so far has been uh, the kind of showstopper. But, you know, like all things, as cost comes down, um, there will be certainly you know, uh, kind of an inflection point where you can use CMOS for catheters. Point of care, yes, remote medicine, yes. So we agree with pretty much the analysis and you will see when I show you the market trend, these are precisely the markets which are growing the fastest. Okay, thanks for that. Okay, let's move on. Um, right, so, so this is the kind of, uh, so now we'll focus on endoscopy, which is kind of the main market for direct visualization. 
So this is how the market is growing. Um, I've used a number of different uh, research reports to compile this information. No, no one research report has this information correctly. I've also used our own estimates uh, based on how we see the market moving. I'll just walk you through it, right? So the blue bar, so we're here. The blue bar is endoscopy of any kind. This is me medical industrial veterinarian. Uh, we're selling roughly about seven and a half uh, devices or cameras. Uh, the next bar, which is red bar, is robotic surgery. Uh, so that's going to increase over time. The green bar is pill cam or capsule endoscope. Um, the purple bar is catheters. Uh, so this was a catheter is a tricky one. Uh, you know, it, it's very sensitive because the number is so big. Uh, you can have very, very large uptake in the catheter volume. So I've just assumed a 5% attach rate. I've assumed about 1.6 billion catheters and a 5% attach rate. Uh, but let's see what it is finally. And the orange is dental. It's a smaller market. Uh, dental has a lot of uh, cost pressure because a lot of the dentistry is paid out of pocket or is done in a dental dentist practice. So there's a lot of pressure on cost. The market is growing quite nicely over the next five years or so at the rate of 30%. So it's a good market to be in. There's plenty of uh, opportunity and plenty of exciting things happening. Okay, so let's talk. Uh, so first of all, why is this happening? Why is this market growing so rapidly? Uh, there are a number of reasons why it's happening. The first set of reasons is socioeconomic trends. You know, we, overall, globally, we have an aging population. As you age, you need, medic, you need more medical treatment. The lifestyle that we lead also leads to diseases that lends itself to endoscopic applications. Healthcare expenses are rising, so hospitals don't uh, want to do procedures which are cost-effective, and also, you don't want to be out of work for a long time. Um, and then you have a rising middle class in emerging countries. Either they can pay out of pocket or they're covered by insurance. There's some legal and commercial uh, reasons, uh, cross-contamination being the, the, the main issue. Um, you know, when an endoscope is used on the first person, if it's not cleaned, and if it's used on the next person, there is always a risk of cross-contamination. And then technology, everything is moving towards CMOS chip on tip. Uh, where the CMOS uh, image sensor is at the tip of the endoscope. Okay, so let's address some of the challenges, right, which I raised. Um, so the first challenge is where does the future of direct visualization or endoscopic visualization lie? Uh, and the answer is CMOS chip on tip. So why is that so? So the first thing is this is the CMOS uh, imaging subsystem. Uh, so you have uh, the image sensor, you have the lens in front of the image sensor to focus the light on the sensor. You have the illumination. It could be an LED or a fiber. <clears throat> you have a cable. Um, you know, endoscopes are long devices. They can be up to four meters long, so you need long cabling. Um, and then you need to process the image that comes from the camera. Uh, so you need um, essentially an, uh, an image signal processor. Uh, the image signal processor can sit inside the handle if you're making kind of a portable device or it can sit in a camera control unit or a video processing unit, which is a much bigger device that sits on a rack. And then the output of the uh, image signal processor goes on to, uh, there are a number of ways you, you can deal with the image. You can either store it, you can transmit it, or you can display it. Um, so, you know, there are a the number of ways how you consume the image. So why is CMOS um, the, the, the choice of the future? The number of reasons for this. Uh, so if you're a device manufacturer, you have a number of uh, options on how you can add visualization uh, to an endoscope. Uh, and people pick CMOS uh, for the following reasons. First of all, you know, we, um, if we have a wide portfolio of CMOS devices, which can pretty much cover any endoscopic procedure from the brain to the knee. Um, the, the image quality of CMOS is excellent resolution, small size, low power. It's a, we, uh, CMOS, we, we can have a system solution all the way from the lens, um, the sensor, the cabling, and the ISP. The pricing is much more attractive than CCD for other means of visualization. And there's a whole ecosystem of partners, lens makers, optoelectronics, optomechanics, ODMs, whole ecosystem of people who can make devices or parts of the devices um, to support these devices. The, the downside is, uh, you know, there's a lot of legacy devices on the market, which are non-CMOS. So those have to be converted. So obviously, as an industry, there has to be investment uh, for conversion to CMOS. 
CCD is the other uh, means of visualization. It uh, has a solid reputation of image quality. Um, it's been around for a long time, so it's, it has established customer base. The downside is the price of CCD is high. Uh, the manufacturer, CCD manufacturer, are now exiting the CCD business, and um, we don't see plans on how these CCD guys are going to enter CMOS. Optic fiber, same thing. It's been around for a long time. You can make very small endoscopes using um, optic fibers. The problem is the resolution is very low. You're talking, you know, maximum 30K um, resolution. That is, you know, for us, a megapixel is very, very easy to do. The image quality is very poor. You can see pixelated images and the price tends to be quite high. Rod lens, um, rod lens are just a bunch of cylindrical glass lenses, which are stacked, um, kind of butted next to each other. Uh, again, they've been around for 20, 30 years. It's an established business. The advantage is they don't need active circuit. It's just a bunch of lenses. You just look down the lenses and you get the image. The downside is they're heavy, they're glass lenses. Uh, the price is very high and, and they're prone to breaking. If it falls, chances are that lens is gonna crack um, and either the device has to be re replaced or repaired. So as a result, CMOS, when you put all these things together, CMOS offers a very compelling value proposition compared to other means of visualization. So what are the technology trends? Technology trends are people are, people want smaller image sensors. Uh, at the same time, people want higher resolution. So obviously both are usually not possible. You can have small, but you can't have high resolution or vice versa. So there's a trade-off. Uh, frame rates are increasing. Um, people want smooth images, no jitter, free, uh, no jitter images. So it's going to 60 frames per, per second. So rod lens, fiberscope, CCDs, they're all being replaced on CMOS chip on tip. And we have special pixel architecture that gives excellent image quality, low noise uh, and very compact devices. Field of view is getting wider, used to be 70 degrees was enough. Now these days it's 120. We have customers already asking us for 160, 170 degree field of view. People want to see wider. People also want to see closer. As we go deeper inside the body, the focusing distance is getting closer. Used to be 10 millimeter was enough. These days it is coming to two millimeter, the close distance. And people want large apertures. As these uh, pixel sizes are getting smaller, the brightness of the uh, images is shrinking. So people want to open the aperture to let more light in. You want small number of pads. You don't want too many wires running back and forth. The endoscope, a lot of the endoscopes are 3D. So they want special synchronization means for stereoscopic 3D. Uh, low power consumption, heat generation. You don't want to heat the tip of the endoscope uh, because that causes patient discomfort. You want, you want to transmit over long distances up to four meters. And if you are going to make a single use device, then cost is going to be very important. So the way you, you go about selecting it, you, you decide what procedure you're going to um, um, design for. Um, so if it's one of the bigger areas of the body like area management or gastrointestinal laparoscope, uh, usually they use a six to 10 millimeter outer diameter, OD stands for outer diameter endoscope. Usually they need 7, 720p to 4K, 2K resolution. And resolution and image quality is the most important parameter there. And we have a whole range of uh, different options, 4K, 2K, 5 meg, 1080p, 720p, which can address that market. If you're going to something smaller, um, in, inside the brain, inside the eye, ENT, cardiac, spi spinal, arthroscopy, uh, gynecology, or uterine renal, um, the outer diameter of the endoscope is going to be much smaller. It's going to be between one to three millimeter. So their size is, more, is most important. And again, we have a range of different options for this part of the market. And then you have a specialized procedure like laryngoscope where you need special optics to focus on the larynx. Um, uh, you have uh, your parts of the body which, is, which are moving very fast. So you need global shutter sensors to freeze part of the body. And then um, cancer cells can be detected, can be visualized better in the near IR um, region of the spectrum. So you want RGB or color and IR on the same image sensor. So we have RGB IR sensors that allow you to switch in real time back and forth between IR and RGB. Okay, so how do we address the challenge of size? You know, small size, uh, is a key driver and how do you address that challenge? So when you look at the procedures, you know, there are many procedures, but when, when you group them, 
Um, the mainly you know, high, volu high, high volume procedure of your nose and throat, AV management, which is everything to do with breathing, cardiac, uh, small joints, arth arthroscopy, and then urology and gynecology. For all these procedures, you need small limit sensors. It's only when you come into the stomach and the intestine where you need high resolution, large limit sensors. So therefore the focus on small limit sensors. So those are endoscopy, same thing with catheters. Okay, all these are different kinds of catheters. Of course, there are many kinds of catheters, but if you just look at the catheters, which are kind of more sophisticated than just a simple tube, again, those catheters all need small limit sensor. So therefore the focus on small size. So what can you do with small size? You know, we have very small limit sensor. Uh, we, have, uh, we have a sensor with the lens, which is only um, 0.5 by 0.5 millimeter. So there are two things that, that you can do with small limit sensor. The first thing you can do is you can add visualization to procedures which today are done blind. They don't have a camera on it. They could be needles, biopsy needles. They could be endoscopic tools. It could be catheters. It could be uh, staplers, harvesters, whole bunch of devices that enter the body. They don't have visualization connected to it. You can now add cameras to it. The second thing you can do is because you can see clearly certain procedures which were too risky now become possible in the brain, in the eye, in the spine, in the, in the heart. Uh, so you have a whole new opportunity set of procedures that become possible. So here's an example of uh, the kind of how small these uh, sensors have become. So this is our image sensor, which is called the OVM6946. That's a one by one millimeter image sensor, including the optics. And then um, this is even smaller than that. This is 0.6 by 0.6 millimeter, including the optics. And you can see as a comparison, how small these cameras are. In fact, this device has even won the Guinness Book of World Record as the smallest commercially available uh, image sensor in the world. The second challenge, which is cross-contamination. Uh, how do you address that challenge? And the way you do it is you make disposable devices. Um, so there's a shift happening from reusable to disposable or single use. So why is that happening? The first and the most important reason is cross-contamination. The second, when you have a reusable device, it breaks, it needs to be tested, it needs to be cleaned. So there's a cost as associated with processing and maintaining a reusable device. And also, you know, hospital buys five or 10 of these reusable devices. They can be quite expensive. Top-end endoscopes can be $15,000, $20,000. So you can only buy so many, five, 10. Uh, when you don't have this device, you have a downtime. And in many cases, it's the cost of the surgeon and the nursing staff, which is more expensive than the actual cost of the medical device. Uh, so you want to reduce the downtime or eliminate the downtime as much as possible. Now, Single use has been talked about for many years, probably five years, possibly even more. Um, but it's really happening. People are making single use devices for the eye, for the ear, nose and throat. And these are real examples. Um, laryngoscopes, for uh, bronchoscopes, for airway management, cardiac catheters, um, uh, uterorenal scopes, uh, uh, hysteroscope, colonoscope and arthroscope. So these are all real world examples of single use devices uh, which are addressing different parts of the body. Now, I'm not saying that reusable will go away. Reusable will obviously remain, but more and more devices um, which come to the market will be single use. Uh, as the cost comes down and the sophistication goes up, it'll take larger and larger part of the market. So here's an example, a real world example, which I thought I'd share with you. So, you know, obviously we're going through difficult times now, um, so there are two examples. Uh, so here's a laryngoscope. Uh, this is a disposable laryngoscope. So basically what you do is you disconnect the blade. This blade is disposable, obviously. Uh, well, even the cable, the cable and the blade is disposable. Uh, the monitor or the tablet is reusable. So uh, this is a laryngoscope is, uh, is needed because you need to intubate the patient. Before you put the patient on a ventilator, you need to intubate the patient. Intu intubation essentially is a procedure where you insert the endotracheal tube. A breathing tube into the patient's uh, trachea. And you need the laryngoscope to essentially hold back the tongue while you're intubating the patient. And uh, video laryngoscope has been recommended over direct uh, uh, laryngoscopy. These are a number of different organizations in the US and Europe who have essentially strongly recommended 
the use of disposable video laryngoscopes. Not only does it make the procedure faster, safer for the patient, but also it allows the operator to maintain a distance from the patient. And we're seeing a big demand for these kind of cameras. The other device that we are seeing a lot of uh, interest in or demand in is bronchoscopes. So if you have a patient who's suspected or has a confirmed case, you need to go and look inside his lung. Uh, so people are using disposable bronchoscopes to do that. And again, uh, the American Association for Bronchoscopy, uh, they have mandated that disposable bronchoscopes should be used as a first line of defense. So these are two real world examples of uh, disposable devices and how they can be used in a crisis situation. You could never do this. Uh, you know, we will be selling millions of these devices. Literally, they've gone from, uh, let's say, one million to five, more than five million. Uh, literally within a span of weeks. You could never do this with a reusable device because it takes a long time to produce. Um, it's very expensive. You need to clean it. Um, it just would not be possible at the global scale that we find ourselves in. So single-use devices, uh, the cost, the manufacturing techniques, uh, the lack of cleaning, um, all those things help in such a situation where you need to deploy uh, medical devices in vast numbers. Um, the key component, one of the key components for a single-use device is the lens. Traditionally, you know, an all-glass lens used to be used. The lens itself is very expensive. So we recognized that and we came up with a solution which is essentially a wafer-level lens. So instead of making a lens one part at a time, we, we have a wafer of lenses. There could be 1,000 or 1,500 lenses on each of these plastic wafers. Usually we use three to five different um, plastic wafers. We align them, we then fuse them, we cut them, we put them on the image sensor, and then we put some kind of black shield around it to prevent stray light from coming in, as well as we create an aperture. And then we test it and off it goes. It's quite a complex process, it, you know, a number of different tool types and process steps. Uh, so it needs a fair bit of investment to do this. So why do it? There are a number of advantages. One is it's the most cost-effective solution. Uh, because these lenses are plastic, because they're made in high volume, is going to be the most cost-effective solution. They're compact, they're all nightly, tightly controlled, so you're not gonna add a lot of dimension. No tuning or calibration, they come out of the, of the factory, they're guaranteed to be within spec. No socket, uh, you don't need this uh, complicated um, integration. You can just solder them directly on a flexible or a rigid PCB. Uh, they can be supplied as tape and reel. They can go through a reflow oven. So you basically just treat it as any other SMT component. And less inventory. You don't need all these, you know, lens holder, socket. You don't need all these suppliers um, and components and simple supply chains. You know, one part number um, and just a simple supply chain. So we are seeing, uh, you know, majority of the single-use devices are now built using these wafer level optics. Um, and then the last challenge is uh, medical testing. You know, different regimes have uh, various test methods. How do you test? Uh, it's a long list of medical testing. Uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, the tests basically group into, you know, image sensors and ASICs. They need to be temp tested for temperature, temperature cycling, humidity, banned substances. If you're making any kind of medical electronics like an ISP, they need to be tested for ESD or electrostatic discharge radiation, patient isolation, the software needs to be tested for robustness. If you're gonna clean these devices, if it's a reusable device, it has to be tested for autoclave. If it's a single use device, you need to test it for sterilization, ETO and sterad. Um, our uh, wafer level optics, uh, they can come in contact with human tissue and fluid. But once you do that, then there's a question of biocompatibility. So we, we test um, for biocompatibility to cells, to skin irritation, sensitization, to the blood, and long-term toxicity. And they have to be waterproof. Inside the body, there is uh, fluids and liquids, so obviously things have to be waterproof. So there's a long list of tests that need to be done to qualify a medical device. So uh, that's pretty much uh, the, 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 the discussion. And then in closing, um, this is kind of a key message. We feel uh, that we truly are we, as well as our partners and customers, are truly advancing healthcare and patient care. As a result of that, we feel that we are truly transforming lives. So, you know, our mission goes far beyond just the component, but to affect human lives. Uh, there are a number of ways you can keep in touch with us. Um, you can go to our website. 
uh, you can send us an email. Um, you can uh, request our sales team to get in touch with you. We even have some videos, uh, demos that you can uh, view. If you look at your chat box, uh, you will see uh, the links to all these different uh, channels uh, popping up. And we leave that on. You can click on the link and that should, allow, that should take, you to, take you to the right place, which will allow you to do any of these actions. So that's pretty much it for me. Um, I guess it's time for Q&A. Uh, Matt, over to you. Thanks, Tazib. We do have some questions for you. Sure. Uh, from one of our attendees, the first question is, what about small CMOS sensors with global shutter? Yes, it's possible. It's certainly possible. Um, uh, until recently, uh, the, the pixel size of a global shutter used to be quite big, three micron pixel, which basically meant you would get very low resolution. But these days, uh, let's say last year or so, we've developed very small pixel global shutters. So yes, technically it's completely possible. No problem, it can be done. It's, a, it's just a matter of business case. Okay, great. We have a question here from Dennis. He says, uh, thank you for the presentation. Can you speak more about Omnivision's offerings in near IR? Is it possible Absolutely. to purchase sample and production quantities with the IR cutoff filter? And do Absolutely. customers have to attach their own lens or is an Omnivision wafer lens available? We'll do them one at a time. I'm sorry for interrupting. Yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, so the first, the first question is, do we have near IR lens? Yes, absolutely. If you do a Google search for Nixel, N-Y-X-E-L, that's uh, a proprietary technology that we have developed to boost the near IR performance significantly. Uh, in fact, it uh, depends on what wavelength you're in. So near IR, so visible spectrum is between 300 to 700 nanometer. Near IR, we, we say is between, let's say, 800 to 1,000 nanometer. So by using Nixel, uh, and you can find nice videos and presentations online that we've done that explain to you, how, you know, what is Nixel, um, how, how do we actually achieve it and what the boost is. So at 850, uh, you can get a boost of around 3X and at 940 nanometer, you can get a boost of about 5X uh, sensitivity. So yes, certainly near IR uh, is something we can do. Uh, what was the next one, Matt? Is it possible to purchase sample and production quantities without yes. the IR cutoff filter? Yes, so the near IR cutoff filter in any image sensor is not on the image sensor. The image sensor sees everything. It sees everything from 300 nanometer to 1000 nanometer. The near IR cutoff filter is always put on the lens, uh, either as a, as a dedicated lens or as a coating on a lens. It's never part of the image sensor. Okay, okay, and then great. there was one more, uh, a third one. Uh, yeah, do the customers have to attach their own lens or is it an Omnivision wafer lens available already attached? Both, we offer both. Um, if you're making a, well, we, we, we can offer the just the image sensor and you design your own lens, uh, glass lens, polymer, plastic, whatever you want to do. That usually people do that if they're making a reusable device uh, because the wafer level optics cannot survive the autoclave cycle. So you have no choice but to use a glass lens. Uh, so then you design your own glass lens, you put whatever coating you want on top of it. If you're making a single use device, yes, we offer uh, wafer level uh, optics and we put a R coating on the wafer level optics. We, we, we can offer wafer level optics with or without the R cut filter, depending on what the customer wants. Yeah, it's okay. possible, no problem. Okay, great. Uh, another question from one of the attendees. What are the limits on the wafer level lens in terms of I believe he says F number or F stop and working distance and resolution. Yeah, sure. Okay, so the, the biggest limitation um, is, um, is the optical format. So roughly speaking, um, you can't, at least we can't, make a good wafer level optics beyond one sixth of an inch optical format. Um, the, the lens shading and the distortion then starts to become quite significant and the image quality is not that great. So usually we stop around, we, we can probably make it about 720p, 1080p, but certainly not 4K, 2K kind of, you know, 4K, 2K tends to be about one over 2.3, one over 2.5 inch optical format. There's no way we can make wafer level optic for such a large optical format. So that's kind of the limit of the wafer level optics. Then in terms of uh, f-stop, 
and uh, focusing distance. So the way we design our wafer level optics is there are two main parameters we look at. One is what is the field of view? Um, uh, it can vary anywhere from 70 degrees to 170 degrees. And then what is the focusing distance in terms of the range of the focusing distance? What's the close focus and what needs to be the far focus? Because the aperture then falls out of that. So we don't design the aperture first. The aperture is what it is once you decide what your depth of field is going to be. Um, obviously, there's an there's a inverse relationship. The wider the depth of field, um, the, the, the slower the lens or the, the bigger the aperture. Oh, sorry, the, 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 the smaller the aperture, the faster the lens you're going to have. So it's a trade-off, right? In an ideal world, you would want a very large aperture and a very large depth of field, but you just can't achieve it. So somewhere there's a trade-off. Usually, uh, our f-stop, uh, by the way, the f-stop actually, uh, the aperture actually increases as the image sensor size decreases. So if you, if you, if you look at our OVM6946, which is a one by one millimeter um, riffle level optic, the f-stop is four or five. If you look at the smaller image sensor, which is OVM6948, the f-stop is 2.8. So even though they actually use the same pixel, the smaller image sensor, because it has a wider aperture, looks brighter. The image looks brighter, but essentially they're the same pixel, it's just a bigger aperture. Okay. Uh, Lars wants to know how much or how many rads can the sensor take? Oh, um, we so if if you if you if you mean by gamma, uh, then no, the the sensor will not survive any kind of gamma radiation, uh, and that's why if you look at sterilization, I listed only ETO and sterad, not gamma sterilization. Um, X-ray, ultrasound, um, high energy discharge, ablation, all that stuff is okay. It uh, doesn't affect the image sensor. You know, worst case scenario, you might see one or two corrupted frames as the energy field gets uh, disrupted. And, uh, you know, there might be some corruption of a frame or two, but it will not destroy the sensor. But gamma rays for sure will destroy the sensor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Eve would like to know, what about global shutters with digital output? I mean, uh, yes. Uh, so, okay, it's a trade-off. Um, if you look at a very small image sensors, we, we have, uh, they are all analog output and we have a bridge chip that does the A2D conversion. Um, the bridge chip usually, usually resides inside the handle or in the camera control unit. Um, so the, the, the small image sensors have analog output, our larger image sensors have digital output. And the reason we do that, I mean, in the ideal world, we would like to have digital output because analog output has problems in terms of noise coupling and things like that. But the reason we do it that way is because it's a trade-off again. If, uh, if you want to put A2D converters on the image sensor, then you're using very valuable real estate, um, which could be used to increase the resolution or decrease the size of the image sensor you're using for A2D converters. Um, so we, we tend not to put A2D converters on small image sensors, we, we leave them out. Um, uh, on the on the high optical format, 720p, 1080p, 4K, 2K, the areas are much bigger, so we can put A2D converters. In terms of global shutter, yes, by nature, global shutter sensors, uh, you know, everything that we make, the A2D converters are on the image sensor itself, so it's a digital output. If we made a really, really small uh, global shutter image sensor, then possibly we might need to do the A2D conversion outside on a bridge chip. But as of today, it's all on the chip, digital art. Okay. Maya would like to know, what about higher resolution, small CMOS cube cameras measuring one millimeter by one millimeter? She says, I saw it on the roadmap. Can you please confirm the availability? Yeah, sure. I mean, this is always, a, this is always a, it's a resolution race, right? Um, so basically, uh, again, the way we specify things is we, we fix the dimensions, let's say one by one millimeter or 0.5 by 0.5 millimeter. And then, um, so there are two things, right? Um, the, the three parameters that we have to play with. One is what is the pixel size? Second, what is the resolution? And third, what are the dimensions, overall dimensions of the device? Um, the way we work is we work backwards. We say, okay, let's fix the dimension of the device because the endoscope and the human anatomy and uh, the size of the endoscope is fixed. So let's fix the size of uh, uh, the image sensor, and then we try not to use very, very small pixels. You know, today in the world, 0.8 micron pixels are available, but we don't tend to use them for 
uh, medical misenses because uh, the illumination needed uh, would be very high, which means you would create a lot of heat as you push a lot of light out, and also you would have noise and other problems. So we tend to have a balance of you know one micron, 1.5 micron kind of pixel sizes. So now you've got a pixel size, you've got your dimensions, and then it becomes a matter of how much can you stuff um, into these uh, dimensions. So today, yes, uh, the one by one is 400 by 400, but over time, the resolution will go up. Um, you know, a few years from now, it's as, as the pixel technology improves, we can start using smaller pixel geometries, 0 0.9, 0 0.8. So then we can, we can think of 1000 by 1000, 1500 by 1500 resolution image sensors in one by one geometry. But we're not there yet, but we, we are working towards it. So the resolution race will continue for the next few years as we try and to pack more and more resolution into these image sensors. We'll have something coming next year, uh, but I can't disclose any more information than that. Okay, uh, Ricky wants to know, are image sensors at the size of the OV6948 and the OV6946 available in monochrome? They can be. Um, so the, the silicon itself on any image sensor is always monochrome. It is colorblind. Um, the way an image sensor is colorized is by adding a color filter array, which is a Bayer format, RGGB. Um, so yes, in principle, any image sensor, any CMOS image sensor in the world, can be converted from color to monochrome by replacing the color filter. You don't have to replace the, the, the change anything in the silicon or the micro lens. You just replace the color filter and instead of using the RGB color filter, you use a monochrome color filter. So yes, it's a, it's a relatively straightforward thing to do. Uh, it just depends on the business case. There's no, there's no technical limitations why it can't be done. It's just a question of business case. Mm -hmm. Okay, Sneha would like to know, tell about plastic lens with CMOS for reusable endoscope. You can use plastic lenses, wafer level optics, which is what I showed you. Um, but you have to be careful. If you're making a reusable device, which is going to be autoclaved, uh, so autoclave is a process where you clean the medical device, you, you increase the temperature to 134 degrees centigrade, 2.2 bar pressure for, depends, 15 to 30 minutes, and you, you have to prove that it can, it can survive anywhere between 500 to 1,000 cycles, which is the lifetime of a reusable device. Now, the wafer level optics will not survive this kind of autoclave cycle. We've tested it, uh, it gets destroyed. Uh, so we don't recommend wafer level optics for any device which is going to be autoclaved. But if a reusable device, not all reusable devices have to be autoclaved, there are other means of cleaning a reusable device, it could, be a dis dis it could be a disinfectant, it could be wipe clean, it could be sterilization. If any of those techniques are used, then, then that's fine. You can use wafer level optics. The only place you can't use wafer level optics is any kind of gamma cleaning or any kind of autoclave. If you're going to autoclave it, then you must use um, glass lenses. Okay, great. Simon would like to know, do you have all these wafer level technologies in-house or do you cooperate with external partners? It's in-house, everything is in-house. It's, it's, it's a key enabling technology. Um, we, um, we, we have our own um, complete production line to do this. Okay. Uh, Sheng Ming would like to know, will HDR sensors be in the medical imaging roadmap? It al they already are. Um, so we have, if you go on our website, you will find uh, an image sensor called OH02A. It's a two megapixel or 1080p, 60 frames per second. And that already has HDR. It has interleaved HDR where you don't have to operate it in HDR mode. You can, you can operate it in normal mode, but you can essentially just flip a bit and it can go into an HDR mode. And basically there are many ways of doing HDR. First of all, there are five or six different ways of doing HDR inside Omnivision. But that particular image sensor has interleaved HDR. So kind of, let's say the odd rows are long exposure, the, sh the, the even rows are short exposure. So you get even and odd, long, long and short exposure. And then at the back end ISP, you have to combine the even and odd rows, and then you have to kind of color map it to get the color correct. Uh, and then you basically you have an HDR um, image. The only downside to that approach is because you have even and odd rows, half the rows are doing long exposure, half the ro rows are doing short exposure, the Y dimension, the resolution is going to be half. 
Uh, so that's the downside. But there are other ways of uh, doing HDR. You can do split pixel HDR. You can do dual conversion gain. Uh, there are a number of ways. So just, just as a point of reference, the standard CMOS, the dynamic range of a standard CMOS is about 70 dB. The human eye can see 105 dB. So there are, there's a 35 dB mismatch between what a CMOS, out of the box CMOS can see and what a human eye can see. So there are various HDR techniques which, which actually in automotive, the HDR techniques go even beyond human vision. They go up to 120 dBs because the machine is looking at the image. Uh, so there are various techniques. Um, each of them has some plus, plus and plus points and, and minus points. Uh, the one that we are offering at least initially is uh, interleaved HDR. And you can take a look on our, uh, on our, on our uh, webpage. You'll, you'll, find the, you'll find the product page. OH02A. Okay, we've got a two-part question here. The first part is, what is the anticipated product life cycle for the OV6946 and the 6948 cameras? Cool. Um, so uh, we, we are, the, the way it works is, first of all, because it's a medical device, we understand um, these parts have to be on the market for a long time. So seven years is pretty much guaranteed, 10 years, no problem. Um, just, to, just to give you an example, um, in, in 2007, we made the first medical image sensor called the 6922, 2007. 13 years back, we are still selling the device. So we don't artificially kill the device. If there's a market for it, we will continue to sell it. Only, the only problem comes when, you know, where, where there's a very low demand for that part, then it becomes uneconomical for us to build uh, at the fab because the fab forces us to say, to take a certain quantity. So then it becomes difficult for us, you know, keeping the price and the cost. So then we work with the customer um, to transition them to a new device. I, even if we were to end of life it, we follow JEDEC standards, six months before the, the part is going to go end of life, you get a notice, end of life notice. And then after the end of life, six months after that, you can still order the part. So essentially you have one year, and this is true for any, any um, uh, image sensor from Omnivision. You essentially have one year to react to any changes. Uh, of the device. If there's a change in the supply chain, color filter or micro lens, because a supply chain has changed something, we issue a part change notice. Uh, so again, you, you are informed of the change and then obviously you can react to the change. It, so these are standard, you know, electronic JEDEC standards that we follow. But we try, you know, we, we will work with our customers as best as we can uh, to have a smooth transition plan. Our goal is not just to pull the part out and leave people in a lurch. We try not to do that as best as we can. Okay. Um, Michael would like to know, are there new sensors for 4K, 2K, UHD at 60 frames per second in a one-third inch format on the way? Yeah, there is. Uh, we, have two, we have two parts coming. Uh, one sh hopefully should be ready end of this year, and the other one uh, should be ready over the next few months or so. One is a small pixel. Um, so that, that focuses on size to, to give a very small, compact 4K, 2K image sensor. The other one is the, 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 the focus is more on large pixels, so very high sensitivity. So it's going to be a larger optical format, larger size. Yeah, so we'll have both the parts over the next six months or so. Just check on our website or check with your sales contact and you will see these parts coming. Both will be 8 megapixel, 4K, 2K. Both can do 60 frames per second. Okay, we, got, we have time now for one last question. What about digitiza digitalization capabilities for small image sensors like the OV6946, especially for transmitting signals over longer distances? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I've, I've explained this. This is always a trade-off. Where do you put the A2D converter? The A2D converter takes real estate. If you put it in the image sensor, then you're, you're consuming real estate. You know, what would you rather have? Would you rather have more pixel, higher resolution, or would you rather use that space? for an A2D converter. We believe that, no, let the, 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 the real estate at the tip of the endoscope is very, very precious. There's a lot of size pressure at the tip of the endoscope, size, heat, cost, everything at the tip of the endoscope. So let's keep that minimal, let's keep that as simple as possible, and then move the smarts, the digitization, either inside the handle or the camera control unit. We can move, there's no technical reason why we can't move the A2D converter inside the image sensor at the distal tip. It's just the architecture choice that we've made. Now in the future, um, as the pixel size shrinks, there may be a possibility of some real estate to be freed up um, where we can actually put the A2D converter and have an efficient. So today we have a four wire analog interface 
we could think of an efficient digital interface um, out of these small image sensors. But again, um, you know, I will always have to make the trade-off. How do I want to use real estate? Do I want more pixels or do I want to put A to D converters? Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, Tahib. Uh, we're out of time for today. Uh, once again, uh, I'd like to thank you for spending some time with us and our attendees today. I want to thank our attendees for all their questions. Some of them we didn't get to, but we'll be able to get through to them uh, via medical.marketing at ovt.com link. And uh, Tazib, if you'd like to give your email for the questions that we didn't get to today, there's about 30 of them. Uh, you can do that now in the uh, either in the chat box or you'd like to broadcast it. I think and, if you just uh, email, uh, you know, as you said, Matt, uh, medical at marketing dot OVT dot com. Okay, um, great. Those all will be directed to me, and that's the right place for it all to go. Okay, so they already have that up there. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank you again, Tazib, and I want to thank all of our attendees for spending time with us. Once again, a recording of this presentation will be available for download. And be sure to register for our upcoming webinars. Visit sensorsdaily.com for all the information you need. And once again, this is Matt Durgis, the editor-in-chief of Sensors Daily, wishing you all a great day. Take care.